one, two. Hello. Uh, we will start in two minutes. People are still coming. Okay, we are almost ready. Miles, looking yeah, forward yeah. to your third lecture. Please. Hi Data. Hi Data. Um, so um, um, if you just give me a, if you just give me a moment, I, I've just got a message to say my my father's been taken into hospital. And oh, sorry to hear that. Just can you just give me five minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, you can, you can, you. you can go offline. It's fine. Yeah. Um, okay, okay, I'm back. I'm, uh, I'm really sorry about that, everybody. And I, I realize I, I was broadcasting and everything. Must, I don't know what you must think, but uh, it, it, it's sort of fine. He, it's, he uh, broken, he's broken his hip. Um, right, uh, nothing I can do. So we'll just go ahead with the lecture if that's okay. Yeah, if, if that's okay for you. Yes it, yeah, yes, it is, absolutely. And I said, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. No, no it's, it, it's totally fine, man. Okay, right. Um, right, okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. 
Um, gosh, the days of COVID, don't they just uh, surprise us in all kinds of ways? So uh, hopefully you can see my screen's full screen now. Yeah, fantastic. That's fine, thanks. Uh, and I just wanted to start off with just this thing. It sort of picks up on what we're talking about last time. And I, I, I think that the logic behind this slide is probably one of the most important logics that is important when you're thinking about doing experiments with down converting crystals. And, you know, I've said all along, even if the pump beam is perfectly collimated, the down converted light isn't perfectly collimated. The down converted light spreads over an angle as it leaves the crystal. And I have to confess that I was many years into doing experiments with down converted crystals before I realized that this wasn't actually a property of the crystal. It doesn't matter whether it's a crystal of BBO, of LBO or whatever. Now maybe there's some very exotic crystals that impart strange phase matching, but within bulk optics, the, the understanding of why the light is divergent is incredibly simple. And that's what I've really tried to capture, give or take factors of pi or root two or anything else. Why is it that the down converted light is not perfectly collimated even when the pump beam is? And it's all to do with the phase matching. And so if we assume that we're gonna start off with a collinear phase match, then we always think that, you know, well, yes, Ki plus Ks must equal Kp. And that's true. I mean, that's when you get the most out, but you'll still get some light out even when it's not perfectly phase matched. So let's think of now about Ki and Ks uh, coming out at a slight angle. So my pump beam's going straight ahead. My, my, my signal and idler photons are coming out one slightly to the left, one slightly to the right. Let's think about how the efficiency of the down conversion process might change as you change that angle alpha. And obviously as you increase alpha, delta K, the phase mismatch will increase as well, as I've sort of shown in the top right here. So let's just write down roughly speaking what the phase mismatch is. And the phase mismatch, blah, 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 is roughly speaking to alpha squared over two times Kp. And how big can that phase mismatch be? Well, that phase mismatch is going to build up as the light propagates through the crystal because a constant delta K. And so it will depend on the crystal length L. So the phase mismatch I will get between the signal idler and the pump will be K delta K times L, the length of the crystal. And roughly speaking, if I want to get efficient down conversion process, I need that phase mismatch to be smaller than pi by two. And so that's, that's this statement here. And from that, just with a simple rearrangement, I get this expression here, that the, uh, the, 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 the divergence of that down converted light is equal to the square root of pi over Kp, the pump divide, uh, multiplied by L, the crystal length. And this is where I was saying that the, you know, the shorter the crystal length, the bigger the divergence. Now that, that you'll, you'll look it up and see it done properly and it will be different by a factor of two or whatever. I mean, the whole thing is a little bit strange because what do I mean by high efficiency? Do I mean the full width half maximum? Do I mean the standard deviation? Do I mean the one over E point? And it, clearly depending on one's precise definition, then one would calculate different angles. And then the other thing to say is that the distribution, because the crystal, is essentially no crystal, crystal, no crystal. And effectively in terms of crystal versus no crystal, it's a top hat function. Then the down converted light isn't actually, it's not a Gaussian divergence, it's actually a sink um, divergence. So again, you know, what do I mean by angle? Do I mean, you know, half height of the central peak? Do I mean, do I mean, um, um, you know, the first minima. Okay, so, you know, that's why I'm not worrying too much about factors of two and things. But that in front of you now is a physical understanding of why there is a down converted, you know, a spread to the down converted light. Now, um, moving on from that, I also said last time that 
in a sort of a little bit backwards thinking, but nevertheless quite effective. Once I've defined that sort of the spread of the down converted light, I've actually sort of defined a numerical aperture for my system. And in defining a numerical aperture for my system, I've also defined uh, effectively a, a resolution, just a classical resolution. And, and roughly speaking, you know, the, the resolution of an optical system is, is you know, half the optical wavelength uh, divided by the numerical aperture or, or, or something of that order. And, and that also happens to equate, although it's, uh, it's a consistency statement I'm making now, not a proof of why when I look at the down converted crystal and I see the position correlation from one pairs, that that position correlation is not perfect. That position correlation purely from a sort of numerical point of view happens to correspond, give or take factors of two, uh, root twos, whatever, to what would have been the classical resolution of this, this, the imaging resolution of the system, given the wavelength, given the numerical aperture. Uh, and so I hope I've said something now that you're probably all sitting there and going, oh, well, I knew that, fantastic. You knew more than I did when I started uh, doing these kind of experiments. And so now I also will add in just one extra thing, being in Austria. Oh, incidentally, I was told to, I, I'm not a football fan, but apparently Scotland beat Austria last night at football. I just wanted to just slip that, slip that in there. Um, um, anyway, um, <laughs> sorry about that. I couldn't resist it. Couldn't resist it. it it's a miracle because we're actually a, a really rubbish team, to be honest. But uh, so I'm sorry. Um, um, right. So the other thing to say is that this angle alpha, which is the spreading, is also very useful for another reason. You're in Austria. You know, the home of entangled orbital angular momentum. I love angular momentum, orbital angular momentum. Wonderful work of the early 2000s by, by, by Anton Zeilinger's group. And um, this angle alpha, for those of you that follow momentum, you'll know it's because the, the, the wave fronts are helical. And, and that means that the local K vectors are inclined. It's almost like one of those water sprinklers you get where all the, you know, the Ks are sort of all leaning over um, in, in the same angle. And you can, you can work out for a given value of L, the orbital angular momentum, what the, and beam size, what the inclination is of the K vectors. And this angle alpha tells you what we call the spiral bandwidth. So, you know, if you start off with a, a BBO crystal, three millimeters long and a pump, uh, one millimeter, you will generate lots of L equals zero, lots of L equals one, lots of L equals two, three, four, maybe, but you will not generate much L equals 50 because you haven't got a down conversion process which will support those high skew angles on the K vector. And if you go through that and look at the kind of results that come out in terms of the spiral bandwidth, the range of L's you can generate, you'll find that this is actually a wonderful predictor. And so it just, you know, just goes saying, if you want to generate a high spiral bandwidth, you use a short crystal <laughs> and, and the same thing applies. Okay, that was all an aside. I was, I was making a slide um, um, to talk about the pump beam divergence for us, and then I got the call from my sister, which I then answered. So I haven't finished the slide, uh, but I, 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 I was wanting to go, you know, I've talked about the position correlation. Why is it that there's a momentum strength of the momentum correlation? And, and again, just from a completely sort of, you know, classical numpty insight point of view, I've got a beam in coming into the nonlinear crystal. That beam has finite size. That beam, because it has finite diameter, also has a non-zero uncertainty in its transverse momentum. Delta X gives me a delta P through the uncertainty principle. And so one way of thinking about the resolution of an optical system is the uncertainty principle, that you've got a lens and the smaller you make the lens, the smaller the delta X, the bigger the delta P, and therefore the more uncertainty 
so to speak, which way the photon's going to go. Um, and you, you go through all the maths and you get, you, you get exactly the Rayleigh resolution criteria. I mean, the Rayleigh resolution criteria is a manifestation of the uncertainty principle. Uh, sorry, the size of a focused Gaussian beam is, is, a, is a manifestation of the uncertainty principle. You get exactly the same numbers out of it. It's just a bizarre way of thinking about it. And so that gives us, if you want to think about it, if you were just going to do this with single photons and you look in the far field, you've got an uncertainty, which is called the diffraction limited spot as to where the pump photon will land. And wherever you can sort of think of it as wherever the pump photon lands, the signal and idler photons will land equidistantly about that point, sort of, if you see what I get. And so that, that uncertainty in, in the position of, of, of the pump photon gives rise to an uncertainty in the momentum anticorrelation. And again, if you just go through the numbers, you get exactly, exactly the right answer. Uh, I didn't develop that slide. Um, um, you didn't, is it my connection? Is the connection of the presenter's microphone very bad? Okay. I've... Yes, that's, that's kind of true, I think. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I will, maybe I was talking too loudly for my microphone. Um, right, that, that's all the past. Uh, today, the, the first lecture last week, I, I was talking exclusively really about using time-gated image intensified cameras. The lecture today, I'm going to move on from time-gated intensified cameras to talk about electron multiplying EMCCD cameras. Um, this looks like a bit of an advert for Andor. It's not meant to be particularly. Um, Andor is, is, is a company that's close to where we are. We're in Scotland, they're in Northern Ireland. So of course it's very convenient. I, I would say, I do think they make very good cameras uh, and certainly all of the experiments we've done has been using uh, Andor cameras um, until the one I'm gonna talk about on Friday, but we'll come to that then. So the, the intensified CCD, you know, if I want to typify its kind of performance, well, it is low quantum efficiency. There's no getting over that. The photocathode maybe has a you know, conversion efficiency from photon to electron of about 15%. It, it, it can depend. Also quite restricted wavelength range. Once you start getting into the infrared, the photocathode efficiency falls off dramatically. If you want to use an infrared photocathode, then you should expect lots and lots of thermal noise, not really going to be very good for single photon detection. But certainly in the blue green region of the spectrum or even out to sort of, you know, 700 or so, you can get, you know, you know a few percent um, quantum efficiency. The, the good news is that you can time gate them very, very precisely. The, the and or ones typically down to a nanosecond or so. Some other manufacturers can go even shorter, 100 picoseconds. And so you, that's not quite the same as saying they have a high time resolution because it's not a question, it's not like a SPAD where the photon comes in and the SPAD records the time at which it comes. Here with an intensified CCD, it, it's a triggered detection. So it's almost just like I'm going to open the shutter now and see whether there was a photon there. And so you have to have some way of heralding the arrival of your single photon now, if it was a, you know, if it was a quantum dot source, that heralding would be the electrical signal to trigger the quantum dot. If it's a down conversion source, then you may use the detection of the idler, as we were doing yesterday, in order to trigger the camera to detect the corresponding signal photon. And then you just have to make sure all your delay times and everything sort of catch up with each other. Uh, and so that's, and then, when you read the data out, you actually get very, very few false positives. So it's possible to read out a completely black image where you go, oh, and there's the photon. Um, uh, oh, there's the photon. You, know, you can pick out you know, virtually a single photon against a very, against a very black background. So you know, fantastic for the heralded ghost imaging we were talking about on, on, on Monday. So let's park that camera technology and let's now move on to a different camera technology. So it is the camera technology um, based on the electron multiplying effect within a CCD, allegedly discovered by accident when someone used the power supply 
on a normal CCD that was too high a voltage and they discovered that it made the images very bright. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't really know. Um, and, and those chips are now made uh, in the UK, actually. They're made in Chelmsford, which is East Anglia in England, if you want to know where that is, uh, by company E2V, or now they're called Teledyne E2V. And I, and I believe it's true that all of the electron multiplying EMCCD cameras that you see in the market today actually use uh, chips, sensor chips from, from, from E2V. Uh, and then what the camera manufacturer does, whether it be Andor or, or Princeton or, or whoever, Hamamatsu, they take that chip and they build it into a camera with the readout electronics. So the good news about the electron multiplying EMCCD camera is because the main market is really uh, two biologists wanting to look at things that glow green, but don't glow green very much, is that they're really incredibly sensitive. They, you know, they have a quantum efficiency sometimes boasting as high as 90% or, or so. Um, they, they, you can't gate them per se. You can just run them at video rates. So you can't trigger them. Uh, but they are incredibly sensitive and they're very high resolution. Um, what's not so good about them, there's two things that are not so good about them. One is even when there's no light at all and you read out a frame, you will find some false positives. It, and, and it's to do with the way the device is read out. It's called clock-induced charge. And that will correspond to about one one photon in every 200 pixels. So even in a completely darkened room, when you read it out, one in every 200 pixels will show a false positive. It will think there's a photon when there's not. The other thing that they're very bad at doing is if I have one photon in the pixel, I've already said that I'm very good at finding it, 80, 90%. If I have two photons in the same pixel, my ability to distinguish that from one is, is, is almost zero. It, I can't photon count with an EMCC team. It basically says, was there, was there one or more photon in the pixel? Now, to some degree, difference between one and 10 photons, one and five photons, but it's very, very difficult to tell the difference between one and two photons with an EMCCD. So that, 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 that's its drawback. So now I'm going to talk about experiments, quantum experiments with an EMCCD camera. And I say, I'm sorry about the fact that those slides quite as uh, advanced as I wanted them to be. So I'm gonna talk about work now, which is, was done by myself, Hermes, Thomas uh, and Paul um, here in, in the University of Glasgow. And I, I've already said that we're talking about using an and or in this case, EMCCD camera, I've said that the quantum efficiency is typically more than 85%. So it's actually even higher than you know, a Perkin Elmer slide. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, dark counts, we'll call dark counts, not normally called dark counts per second. Here, I'm talking about dark counts per pixel. So it's about one over 200 pixels. Frame rate, tens of hertz, and number of pixels, 512 by 512, or indeed 1024 by 1024. Uh, and here's a selection again, papers I've spoken about in, in, in terms of doing, doing quantum measurements with a camera. Uh, I, I love this animation so much, I thought I'd show it. Uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry, Miles, to interrupt. Uh, your sound quality is not as good as before, like last lectures. I don't know if it's because of your. Uh, do you have a Bluetooth microphone or headset or? Um, I will. I will switch that back on, okay? Oh, thanks. thanks. I've gone to the wired connection. Uh, is that any better? It's hard to say now. Maybe we can, we can check. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Just to interrupt me again if it goes crap, because it's obviously thanks. pointless. Um, the same video cartoon as I showed you before. Uh, and the same logic applied to this cartoon. Uh, when I look carefully, I see that my photons are generated uh, in spatially correlated pairs. Uh, I've already explained that, that that spatial correlation is not quite perfect. 
it, it is it has a blurriness which corresponds to the um the the the, the numerical aperture wavelength of the down converted light so it, it's likely to be several tens of um in tens of microns but other than that it's the same now in mundy's work what we did was we imaged one of those and used the other beam as a gating signal to trigger the camera. Today, I'm not going to image one of the beams, I'm going to image both of the beams. I, I could do that using two different cameras. In, in our experiments, we have basically done it with one camera because we're poor, uh, but we've used the left hand and the right hand side of the chip. And so our, our signal and idler beams are imaged onto the left-hand side and the right-hand side of, of, of the chip. Now, the sort of interesting thing here and the basis of what I'm going to talk about certainly later is that when you actually look at the signal and either beams on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the chip, like I've sort of shown at the top here, they don't look quite the same. They look to be different. Why do they look to be different? They look to be different because the quantum efficiency is not 100%. So one of the images might have some photons that the other image doesn't have. Similarly, there's quite a few false positives. So some one of the images, some of the images, each of the images will have noise events in them, which are clearly not correlated between them. And so if I now run an AND operation between the left hand and the right hand image or the signal image and the idler image, I, I can with greater confidence say those events which appear in both images are more likely to be photons than noise. And so it gives me, if nothing else, a way of distinguishing the photon events from the noise events in my single event images. So let's, let's have a look and see whether it is possible with these rather bizarre performance specs of the camera to, to actually record correlations. And so there's two kinds of correlations that I'm interested in looking at, obviously. One is I am interested in looking at image uh, correlations in the image plane, the position correlation. And the other thing is I'm interested in looking at the momentum correlation. How could I do that? Well, I simply have to change the lens configuration between the crystal and the camera. Uh, so in the top case, I am imaging the crystal onto the camera. It is tempting to say that you would expect both of the photons to end up in the same pixel. But remember what I've just said to us, the position correlation of the photon is not perfect. So even the, so the signal and idler photons and are usually 10, 20 microns apart from each other. And so rather than seeing both photons arrive in the same pixel, I would expect to see both photons arrive, but in adjacent pixels, okay? Now, in the momentum correlation, remembering it's an anti-correlation, if one of the photons arrives at 12 o'clock on the clock face, I expect the other photon to arrive at six o'clock. If one of the photons is a long way from the beam axis, I expect the other photon also to be a long way from the beam axis. And so I expect to see photon pairs appear around the, around the beam axis. And that, those are the two different ways I might expect to see it, uh, which I've tried to show here. I've also put up again the, uh, the, the strength of these correlations. And so that's the idealized situation. If I put the camera in the image plane of the crystal, I expect to see photon pairs side by side. If I put the camera in the far field of the crystal, this is all with a collinear phase match, I expect to see the photon pairs symmetric about the, the beam axis. What I actually end up seeing, of course, is some missing pairs and quite a lot of noise. And so we need to essentially uh, look for the correlations quite carefully if we're going to observe them. But in this paper that we published now nearly 10 years ago, I, th I think this was a pretty 
I'm pretty pleased with this particular paper, we were able to show that the, we could image these correlations both in the image plane and indeed in the far field plane. It turned out that the strength of the correlation was that which we would have expected. And we saw these correlations around over around about 1,000, 2,000 spatial modes. So that the, um, that the size of um, the crystal, the thinness of the crystal and the size, you know, if you want lots of spatial modes produced, we've already said you have a thin crystal and you pump it with a large pump beam. And we got that up to about two or 3,000 spatial modes. Now, that's just showing really that you can use the camera fit to detect these photon pairs. I'm now going to go on and talk about how we might use that ability to do imaging. Uh, so here is the, I'm going to talk about two different things. Uh, the first of them is this based on actually this, this theoretical proposal here. I think this is the first person to propose it. Quantum imaging beyond the diffraction limit by optical centroid measurements. The basic idea, which I'll repeat in the subsequent slides, is that I am going to send both the signal and idler beams through the same object. We're not, it's not ghost imaging where one of the beams went to the object and one of the beams went to the camera. Here, both the signal and idler beams go to the object and the camera images both the signal and idler beams, ideally recording both photons. Having recorded both photons, what do you do? Well, you either got two bits of data to add to your image, or as was proposed here, you take the centroid of the two photons that, that you found, and you record the centroid as the image data. And then two more photons come in, you record the centroid, two more photons come in, you record the centroid, and you build up an image not of where the photons land, but of where the centroids are defined. And in doing so, you beat the classical diffraction limit by a factor of root two, because there's two photons there. That's where the square root comes from. So um, this essentially is what I've just described. This is work that was originally done in, in our group by Hermes here, his nice smiling face on the left. So we come in with our type one crystal. Uh, it generates the photon pairs. Those photon pairs are entangled, one assumes, but we are only using the fact that they are momentum, sorry, that they are position correlated. That's the important thing. Those position correlated photons strikes the target. And then we image the target onto the camera and we record at the camera these photon pairs but we don't record the events as where the photons are. We record the events of where the centroids are. So from this data on one frame of the camera, the, the image information is contained in those four data points, which essentially I log as my accumulating image. So, um, so okay, one, one, one sets off doing that. And, 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 and I'll be honest, it's, it's, it's quite hard. Um, one needs to be incredibly careful at eliminating stray lights because the last thing you want is sort of random photons landing on your camera. Um, you then need to go through some kind of, um, well, first of all, you have to set the correlation length. How strong do you want the correlations to be? Because if the correlations are too strong, the photons will end up in the same pixel. And I've already said, my camera can't distinguish two photons from one. It can only distinguish one. So I need my photons to end up in neighboring pixels. But if the photons are too far apart, they'll end up with two photons here. But because my camera's not perfect, I'll end up with a third hotspot here, which might be a photon or might be noise. And so all of a sudden I've got three things and I go, what's the bisector? Because my three objects give me three bisectors. Let's assume that two of those things are the photon pair and one of them is noise. So one of my bisectors will be useful. My two other bisectors will just be making matters worse. So there's a, there's a happy medium where my photons are not in the same pixel, but not too far apart. 
So I, I need to control the correlation length to show this effect. Uh, so you need to set the magnification effectively, either very carefully, or you use a, an additional aperture to control um, the, the, the strength of the correlations for the, for the reasons we've just seen. Having done all of that, you then need to set about defining some kind of computer algorithm, which will look for these photon pairs and go, yes, that's a photon pair. Uh, where's the bisector? Okay, that's the bisector. Or it can look at these photon pairs and go, nah, I think one of them's noise and that's not a real, that's not a real bisector. Or, oh, oh dear, there's too many events in that particular bit of the frame to really work out what was going on. Um, and so one can do all of that. And of course, all of that does, the, the, there's a great penalty for incorporating bisectors that are not real. So one really needs to err on the side of caution, which also then results in inefficiency. So, but nevertheless, you can find, as we sort of, you can see with the sort of various things we've got down there, that you can, you can identify some photon pairs and you identify some bisectors associated with that distribution. You then take another frame, identify more photon pairs, add in the bisectors, add in the bisectors. Uh, uh, and just cutting to the chase, we would be typically operating in a regime where we, for each frame of the camera, had between, let's say, five and 10 uh, meaningful bisector events, which we were confident about. So it takes quite a long time to build up a full image. Uh, sorry, Miles, can I ask something? Yeah. I, so in the previous slide, I what's this bright spot in the middle of the picture, like the whole this this square or rectangle, the, the bright rectangle uh, in in the three pictures uh, in the three it, images. It, it's meant to. It's meant to be <laughs> one of the one of the rectangles in this bar chart. So it's a test target. I'm looking at the test target here. My object's a test target, and I'm essentially zoomed in, and so I'm just looking at one of the the bars in the test target. So where I've got um, where I've got um, light is where the test target is open. And, and what I'm really showing here is that these ones out here are showing these false positives are just noise and because they're in the dark, but they're in the what we will realize later is the dark region, but it's just trying to tie the things together. That wasn't very clear in what I said. I hope it was a bit clearer. So, so the images down there are actually like, uh, they're, they're like signal and, and idler beams, like uh, because- the, the, the pairs, the, mm -hmm. the uh, one when you see the two photons together so so i've labeled all the vents afterwards you know this is post labeling so these are actually real images that's the first thing to say these are the real images after everything's been added together um and, and this is this image on the left hand side here is is actually the image that one gets just by summing all the photons together and so we've just decided all of these photons here were real and we just added them all in. And, and that resulted in uh, this image that we see here, a little bit blurry. If I go back now to the fully right-hand side one, which is my photon pair image, the image we actually got, so you can compare the experimental results, that this grayscale image, forget about the photons here, is the sum of all the photons image. This one on the right-hand side is the sum of all the bisector images. And then I've gone back to one particular frame in the data set, looked at that particular frame, and you can see that this particular frame contributed four detection events to our image. This, these things here were also in the image, but we go actually, you know what, they were the, just dark events because they appeared by themselves. How long is the exposure time? Or so the, the so we're running it at about ten frames a second. Uh, so we're getting a total number of an event count of about fifty meaningful events a second. So it obviously takes quite a while to build up an image, and I'm going to show you some uh, images that have been summed up over something like a hundred thousand frames shortly. So with, with, with some of the images I'm now going to go and look at correspond to essentially a couple of days of summing data.
Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So this is essentially a look in the lab. And I, I mentioned stray light. I mean, in one way, it's a very simple optical system. It's, it's a down conversion crystal, uh, an object, four lenses, an aperture, and a camera, all in a straight line, perfect for opto mechanics. When you actually come to build it in the lab, because there's such a premium on not having any stray light getting in, you just build the whole thing with a bellow system. So you can see the, this is the object. Uh, that's the aperture. Oops. Uh, that's the aperture here. Uh, this is the CCD here. And you can see the various lenses on mounts and the like. So just saying from a practical point of view, you, you really want to exclude the dark converted light. Now, these images are going to be a little bit underwhelming. Factors of route two are sometimes hard to see. Um, but I'm showing you two images here. One image is the sum just the straight sum of all the photon events. And the other image is the sum of the bisectors. And then I'm going to zoom in. So it's a light bulb. It's a filament from a light bulb. That was the object in this case. And I think you can see that the object, that the image on the right-hand side has a slightly higher resolution than the image on the left-hand side. And indeed, that is the bisector image. Um, I do the same thing here with some other uh, images. The one on the left-hand side is the sum of all the images. Look here in particular at this sort of um, strand. You can see here with higher contrast, sharper image. Again, funnily enough, it's the image on the right-hand side that is the, is the bisector image, so it seems to be work. And here's essentially a fly wing struck into the system. And in this case, I hope you can convince yourself that it's the image on the left-hand side which has, a, a, let's say, an overall more pleasing quality. Um, oh, glass fibers, we've seen enough. So this is the MTF. Unfortunately, we did not get a factor of root two. We got about half of the anticipated improvement. And the reason for that is effectively the false bisectors making the message worse, that we are not correctly filtering our false bisectors from our real bisectors but not yet published. Um, I hope we can see here that we have been doing some more work on that. So on the left-hand side here, we've got the, the, the classical sum image. In the middle here, we've got the quantum bisector image. And then here we've got another further trick up our sleeves where we are effectively looking at the difference between the two images and extracting uh, essentially a filtered quantum image information image. And this is approaching much more uh, our factor of root two, albeit with, with worse dynamic range. So there's something that, that you can do uh, with an EMCCD camera. Whether it's really worth the effort to do is, is, is a separate question. I'm now going to move on to a second experiment, uh, which I think the effort, where the effort is more clear. And, and so the second experiment is essentially a demonstration of the, uh, I think the original quantum illumination protocol that was originally proposed by Seth Lloyd in this paper in 2008. And, and here we're doing something slightly different, but again, it's a linear system. But whereas it before, we were passing both the signal and idler beams through the same object here, I've gone back to a situation where only the single signal beam passes through the object and the idler beam we're going to use as a reference beam. Uh, and so that is conveniently achieved by placing the, um, the, 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 the target in the far field of, of the crystal. Uh, and in this case, a type two phase match ensuring that the single and idler beams are displaced from each other. And then we image both the signal and the idler beams side by side back onto our EMCCD camera. Now, this is essentially a slight change on what would, so before, this is the case here where I've got essentially the pump beam in the middle. I've recorded an idealized frame. This is what I might expect to see. I've got this photon is paired with that photon. This photon down here is paired with that photon up there. So this is just the anti-correlation in, in position. Um, 
I want to find which of those events are common to both images. So, because I'm now going to add in noise, not so obvious what corresponds to which. So I'll just give that one a twizzle round. I'll then run an AND operation between the two regions. And that gives me, again, recovers the real photons. So these are the real photons, not the noise. These are the real photons. It's not the noise. And importantly, it's not the thermal background light. If there's some thermal background light, that will give rise to photons, of course, over all or some of the image here, but they will not be anti-correlated in their position with their partner photon in the other half of the image. So it allows us to distinguish the down-converted photons and distinguish them both from sensor noise and thermal background light. So let's keep going. Uh, and so again, a very, very linear system. Again, I would add that we actually uh, do go to great lengths to keep out stray light. We, we go to great lengths to really understand how to interface our camera such that we get the minimum amount of clock induced charge in terms of the readout rates and all those kind of uh, endless settings that you wonder what they're there for. Well, you begin to realize what they're there for when you try and minimize the dark noise. And this is basically the idea of what I want to try and show you. Uh, so we've got a schematic here. This is the quantum illumination. It's the signal and the idler photons that we've spoken about. The basic idea is the signal photon is going to go off and illuminate the object to produce an image over here. But we're also looking at, we'll call it the quantum reference. We're calling it, you know, the idler photons. Which, which of these events were real? To make matters harder for the system, we've then deliberately introduced some thermal illumination. And that thermal illumination is, is, is illuminating a cage. And then I am projecting the cage onto the sensor. And so what my classical image, we'll call it a classical image, is, i.e. the sum of all the photons, that is a sum of the down-converted signal photon and the thermal photons. I should say that all of these photons have the same coherence length, all of them have the same polarization. They are indistinguishable from each other, other than when I do the AND operation, I'm only going to pick out, to the first approximation, the photons, the, the, the signal photons in this image. And so by performing the AND operation, it allows me to recover the true image of the object not corrupted by the uh, thermal light image. So that is all in principle. Let us show you in practice. Uh, so what we're doing here, it, you can just see this top one here, that this is essentially the sum on the camera of all the events. And you can see there's an image of a bird and you can see that there's an image of a cage. And then we run the AND operation and we get this. This is essentially, we've improved the contrast now between the uh, bird and the cage. It's not perfect. Why is it not perfect? It's not perfect because you've got the accidentals. You've got the, well, there just happened to be a thermal photon that was lined up with that particular piece of noise or whatever, and it gave me a positive and count. And so what you're seeing here, this residual cage is the and events between the thermal photons and random noise photons in the system, readout noise. So the readout noise is unfortunately pulling through some of the thermal um, signal. But if you then go, but I know what that is because I know what the fill factor is. So I know statistically how much of the signal's not real. You can not in an arbitrary way, but in a very controlled mathematical way, subtract these images from each other to reveal the image you might have originally hoped for, so the recovered image of the bird in this case. So this is all experimental data. And then what we're doing as we're going down the rows here is increasing the brightness of the cage with respect to the brightness of the bird. 
And in this case, we get up to a point where here, the cage is 10 times brighter than the bird. Given the sort of low signal to noise generally due to the low light levels, the bird is now no longer visible at all, I would say in the left-hand image. But then when we apply our AND gating operation between the signal and idler, followed by the subtraction, we pick out the bird once again. And so this idea of using uh, the signal and idler as sort of probe and reference is, is, is related to some discussions around quantum radar. Clearly, this would be quantum LIDAR in this context. And, um, you, you, and you sort of think, well, you know, isn't it normal when I sort of do any kind of measurement with a laser, I'd have a reference photodiode and my signal would be the signal photodiode divided by the reference photodiode or something like that. And the answer is yes, that, that, that idea of sort of splitting the source in two and using half of it as a reference is a completely standard thing here. And all we're doing here is, is applying it to the quantum regime. But as we've often spoken about in the past, of course, I can't do that with a beam splitter. If I really want my two beams to be the same at the level of individual photons, then it, essentially the down conversion source is, is what does that for me. So um, that is where we are there. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry Miles, can I ask something? Yep. Um, so the, the goal is to image the, the bird. Here. Yes. So can you just use the, 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 the image that you get from, from the idler to just, like, I, if you go back here, yep. the, can so you just, just use the, why you can't use the... the so if, the I had, okay. yes, if I had no thermal light, you know, if I block the thermal illumination, clearly there would be no cage, but there would still be sensor noise. So my, my idler, my, my signal beam here would, 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 um, would obviously contain the image of the bird and it would also contain noise events from the sensor. I then make matters worse by adding in some thermal background. Perhaps I'm going to try and do a quantum optics experiment outdoors or whatever. I'm going to try and do some imaging in an outdoor environment where I've got sunlight or, 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 or some other confounding factors. Maybe someone's going to try and mislead my imaging system by projecting false images onto it. Uh, maybe I've got multiple imaging systems all trying to image something at the same time. I'm thinking now a sort of automotive um, LIDAR or whatever, where you've got like pulsed light sources trying to work out where the objects are. That's sort of fine if you've got one car, but if you've got 10 cars all with their pulsed things, then maybe again, you've got a confusion between systems. So what I'm really trying to do is distinguish the real, let my photons from, from your photons. And so that's what I'm hopefully trying to show here that you know, you're know you the baddie, <laughs> you, you're projecting a cage, I'm trying to image a bird, uh, I, but I can reject your light compared to my light because only my light has its partner, its, its idler photon partner. So I'm using the idler as a sort of, as a sift, as a quality control on, on which events that I know are real or, or are, are mine. Um, I'm doing the same thing here, just with a high lot of thermal noise on the camera. This is actually a wing, a, a, another wasp, sadly lost to the cause. Looking again on the left-hand side, this is the raw image from the sensor but then applying the AND operation from the idler beam to, to recover an image much, much, with much higher contrast on the, on, on the right-hand side. So, um, okay, so that, that's the end of my second lecture. Uh, hopefully, I, I've shown some of the things that one can do with an EMCCD camera as, as opposed to an intensified CCD camera. I should say on Friday, uh, I'm going to talk about a camera not made by Andor. I'm going to talk about a camera made by, by, by Hamamatsu, uh, which is a CMOS camera, not CCD at all, but it's a CMOS camera with an unbelievably low readout noise. 
such that it can distinguish one photon in the pixel from two photons in the pixel, from three photons in the pixel. So it is a scientific CMOS camera, which will actually photon count. Uh, that sounds fantastic. Uh, the, the, not the slightly less fantastic news is that it sometimes counts one when actually the true answer was zero. So although it is incredibly low noise in its ability to distinct, it's much better at telling the difference between one and two photons than an EMCCD is, but it is probably slightly worse at telling the difference between zero and not zero photons. So, you know, horses for courses, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And that camera, I think, was launched about a month ago. We had a play with it about four months ago when it was still in, 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 in sort of beta test mode. And um, I was ma massively impressed um, with it. I mean, it is the, the lowest noise CMOS camera I've ever seen or, or played with by a country mile. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's Friday's. Um, I just wanted to refer you to this review article, Imaging with Quantum States of Lights. It's an article we published a couple of years ago now. But if, even if I say so myself, I think it gives quite an, a good overview, not just of our work, but of the field in, in general. So um, thank you very much. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions you might have now. Thank you, Miles. Thank you very much. Questions for Miles? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So usually in all these photon pair sources, either crystals or quantum dots, you you want to have just one pair produced, like not a double pair production. But here it looks like that this would actually help you. Um, that's a good. That's a good question. Uh, and indeed, um, well, okay, for Monday's work. It doesn't help us because we trigger the camera. We want to find the other photon pair. If there's two photon pairs, you get a real problem. In this work, clearly there's going to be many, many of photon, photon pairs within a single uh, frame of the camera, given that my camera is running with the you know, exposure time of several milliseconds. And that's sort of okay because I've got lots and lots of pixels. What would be bad news would be two photon pairs in the same place. Now, you know, all of these things are statistical. So the more photon pairs I allow onto camera anyone, the more likely that I'm going to confuse which pair is which. Um, and in most of the experiments that we've done, the experiment works best. You know, if I if I run it at one photon pair per frame, I get one photon pair and unfortunately quite a lot of noise events. If I run it with lots and lots of photon pairs, then my photon pairs get confused. So there's clearly some happy medium in between. And for reasons which are not entirely obvious to me, but will sound eminently sensible, if you are wanting to get the best signal to noise, the flux that you should be using is the flux where the number of real photons in the image is roughly equal to the number of noise events in the image. And, and for reasons that I don't, well, I can't prove that it's true <laughs> other than when you actually run it at different light levels, it turns out to be about true. Um, so if you think of, um, I said that you're getting a noise event for every 200 pixels, let us assume that I'm going to do an experiment on a subset of the array, which is let's say um, 100 by 100 pixels. Well, the number of noise events in that given that I have one noise event per 200, will be about 50. And so I would then set up the experiment to be running with about 25 photon pairs per frame. So coming back now to your, your question, when you were saying, do you want one photon pair or more? 
what I would say in that instance is that you want about 25 photon pairs per frame. And that would turn out to give you the most, um, the best signal to noise. Does that? Um, Does that answer your question? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said yes. OK, we have another question. Since you mentioned the quantum radar, um, actually, how far down in frequency can you go with such approaches? Like in, I mean, radar is typically in the order of hundreds of gigahertz, right? At most. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it, I mean this is obviously um, I mean, the good news is about the EMCCD it is it has a broader wavelength sensitivity than the um, than the intensified cameras I spoke about before. So, you know, an EMCCD, particularly if back thinned, you know, you're going to get reasonable performance from, I don't know, 300 nanometers out to 800, 900 nanometers or so. Clearly, this is not a technology which extends even into the short wave infrared, let alone um, microwave, where you would normally think of using radar. I, I, I was just making the, the link into radar because you know, barely a week goes by without me reading something about quantum radar in, in a sort of in the sort of non-technical literature about, and I was I was trying to explain some of the principles and, and one embodiment of quantum radar is that people suggest that it might be possible to, by, by basically having a, fo a, a, a photon pair source in the radar regime, to use one of those photons as the probe and the other one as a photon by photon reference, thereby perhaps suppress some element of black body radiation. I think there's a lot of missing technologies in that in that proposal, but clearly they are technologies that are being worked upon. Uh, and so what I was really wanting to say was in some ways that this is the analogy of, of, of quantum radar, other than of course, I'm not doing any timing here. Uh, well, okay, then maybe one would need to go back to the idea of using the gated camera to, um, to, 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 to bring in a delay, or for that matter, a, you know, a, a, a genuine multi-element SPAD array where you, you, you see the two photons arrive side by side, but one of them arrives later than the other because it's essentially um, you know, being on a delay. <laughs> um, so you can recognize the photon pair events by their spatial proximity and you, you um, deduce distance in the imaging system for one of the arms from the temporal delay. Thanks. Can I use EMCCDs without threshold photon counting modes? And is it still sensitive to single photons? Um, I mean, as with most cameras, when you read out, you just get some numbers. <laughs> and what one would see, um, when you read out from an EMCCD, there's a background level, and then the presence of light causes the signal to go above that background level, and it and it's normal then to set a threshold effectively, uh, and of course the lower one sets the threshold. The more photons you measure, but the more noise you pick up, and the higher one sets the threshold. The fewer photons you measure, but the less noise you pick up, uh, and so to some extent there's a trade-off between the quantum efficiency by which you can detect a single photon and the, the noise level by which you get false positives. It, it turns out that that's an incredibly aggressive uh, trade-off. So if you really want to reduce the noise, then you have to be, you, 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 you cripple the quantum efficiency, to, to be blunt. Um, you tend not to have that much wiggle room uh, in, in it. And, uh, and of course, it's not helped by the fact that the noise is non-Gaussian. I mean, I, I think a lot of the, you know, when people start going through detectors, not just 
EMC TDs, SPADs, everything. You know, if if the noise was Gaussian, <laughs> then you go, that's fine. I'll sit at five sigma and I will eliminate all my noise and I'll still see my photons. But the um, but the noise distribution in, in many electrical devices has very, very long tails. Um, so you, you, you know, you think you've set a threshold a long way above the average noise, but you, you've, you've still got a non negligible number of noise events, which, which, um, which get there. So, um, a lot of readout electronics on detectors is non Gaussian in its noise characteristic. Any any more questions? Yes, please. Can you please quantify or clarify the quantum advantage? Because it seems that you could get the same advantage with scanning laser. Um, so what? That, um, so it's in, it's interesting. Um, as I said, one can do probe reference type classical experiments. One can't do that at the level of single photons because beam splitters don't split evenly when you've only got one photon. I mean, what if you think about sort of equivalent classical systems in, in the time domain, it would be a laser which had a random temporal pulse sequence. So if you want to make a LIDAR system, for example, which is going to be difficult to uh, mislead, rather than sitting there with a laser which has a regular pulse of 100 megahertz or whatever, one would, one would go for a much more randomized pulsing of the laser, even if the average number of pulses was 100,000 megahertz. And then, would, then one would have this random, uh, random, pseudo random pulse sequence, which you would correlate back to the pseudo random trigger sequence that generated it in, in your source as you sort of slide the signals over each other. It, that would be the temporal equivalent. In this case, what one would do is one would have a, you know, imagine a quantum dot source that I can emit a single photon. I mount that on an XY stage and I, and I, and I move it around, I, I move it around randomly, uh, giving out photons at random positions. But clearly, I, I would know as the, as the owner of the device, uh, what those random positions were, and I would then therefore be able to correlate them spatially with the signal that I recovered. And, and so, uh, yes, absolutely, there, there is a classical, if you want to say that, counterpart. Uh, and, and why shouldn't there be? Because in terms of you know, what makes quantum quantum, simply having position correlation is, is, is classical. Quantum is when I have position correlation and momentum correlation. So the, the fact that I'm only using half, let's say, the, the quantumness of the source means it, it is absolutely possible to think up equivalent, uh, tech, uh, sorry, uh, scientifically, conceptually equivalent classical schemes. The question you're then left with is, is it easier to make a quantum dot source on a rapid, um, I said translation stage, obviously it could be Galvo scanner system, whereby I can send my single photons around in a random temporal spatial sequence. Is it easier to do that? Or is it easier to use a down conversion source and, and use the idler beam as, as my monitor of where the, of, of where the photon is? But, but, you know, beyond the imaging, what, what I was hoping I was going to be able to do in my lectures today, uh, and, and indeed this week, was, was talk about the use of cameras, detector arrays in, in quantum measurements. And another way of thinking about the lectures is I'm, you know, illustrating that different camera type technologies with different, um, with different types of experiment. Okay, great. So... If there are no any more questions, 
let's thank Smiles again. Thank you. I am sorry about the rather bizarre start <laughs> no, to that. No. I will now go and find out what's happened. Okay. Thank you very much. We hope you yeah. get well soon. Thank you very much Thanks, indeed. Uh, and, uh, I will okay. see you all on Friday. I, I think at half past nine UK time, which I think is oh. half past ten your time. Um, let's, let's, let me check, check quickly. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's from 10.30 uh, Vienna time to 12, so it's one and a half hour. Okay, I look forward to see you. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Ritu. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.